what people don't realize is the time I missed from having to provide, I could never get back with my kid. So naturally, I'm always going to have that regret. I sacrificed a lot of time away from him to provide and get comfortable enough where I'm at. But I can't ever get that time back. Hey, Raindrops. Before we get into this episode, I want to invite you to join my community, my YouTube community, honey, of subscribers. So please make sure to subscribe to this channel. I love when y'all comment on my posts and my videos about all of my stars hopping on Reality with the King to share their lives. I cannot thank y'all enough, so make sure to like and subscribe to this channel. Um, you know what? I have some. You. you have it over there. Okay, perfect. Okay. Erica Mena. Before we get started, I, I do want to ask you this though. Um, how are you doing? Uh, I'm still having my moments of like, damn E. Like you did so much work. Damn. You know. Um, but at the same time, I do feel like uh, I don't want to say this something like this had to happen, but it was time <laughs> for me to really close out that chapter, and which was what I was ironically doing. Um, this was my final option on contract with them. So, um, and obviously with the last two years of my life being so crazy, I was excited about finishing out this one. Um, that would leave me no more options old, for those who don't understand. When you sign on to reality TV, um, there's things called, there's something called an option, which is yes. how much you owe the network as far as how many times you come back. You, so when you sign a contract as a reality star, so I, you think, know. I think this has been working scripted too. When a reality star signs a contract for one season, the network has options on you. It can mm -hmm. range from two options to three options, which is equivalent to a season. Yeah. Um, so you're- So you, each option is considered a season. So this was much. my last, option on contract that I owed them. So that would leave me just being one year exclusive to them in reality. But obviously, you know, you get permission and I can do other stuff and stuff like that. But I say all that to say, like, I was really excited to finish out this one just for my freedom for the first time after all these years, because coming into this, you know, the way I signed on to Love and Hip Hop was an ambush. And I haven't, you know, been paid back appropriately since, you know? Mm. So before we get into the Love and Hip Hop of it all and, and what happened recently, I want to get to know you. Because one of the things that I do know about you is that you had a very tough childhood. And I don't think a lot of people understand your background, so I would love to give you the opportunity to begin there. Um, you are a product of being, your mom was pregnant with you while she was in jail. Mm -hmm. Was she in prison? Mm -hmm. Your mom was in prison. Mm -hmm. And she literally was pregnant mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. while she was in prison. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you went to the foster care system, was mm -hmm. raised by your sister for a short period of time. Yeah, for, so um, back then, and even still, the system is very neglectful towards children. So there was a lot of ways to get around it. And my sister being 18 at the time, my oldest sister, Lisa, she was able to kind of lie and kind of, so for a short period after um, my mom gave birth to me, she did have me. 
but it wasn't very in jail. Yeah, she my mom, my sister was able to take care of me for a little bit okay. after being born. So my sister had me for a little bit, ducking and dodging AC, ACS as much as possible. That was like our life for a while. Um, but yeah, and then it was foster system. So and so it's weird because it's layers to my my childhood. That's like hard and traumatic and. And then there's beautiful moments, too. Why was your mother in prison in the first place? Um, my mom was one of those women, like, like a lot of us today, that was just a go-getter. Before I even get into that, I would like to get a little background on my mom so people aren't assuming like she's just this, you know. Um, my mom, at a very early on, lost her mom. And she was then put into group homes where she was raised by nuns, which a lot of them were extremely abusive. So um, my mom kind of had it rough, had my first sister at 16, and then came Linda, and then a couple of years later came Josie, and um, then came me. And um, but all of which she's always been one of those women to do whatever it takes to provide for us. That's one thing I know about my mama that stands out. There's one thing you're gonna tell me about my mama if my mama's gonna provide for us. So that's, you know, she's just been the hustler and that's where me and my sister, Lisa, get our hustle from. Um, so it, was, it came down to her providing and she wanted to get me this crib. And in order to get me this crib, she had to do a run and that run, wrong place, wrong time. So, but. So your mother went to jail because she wanted to provide you with a baby crib. Yeah, there was a crib she seen on Fordham Road, and she said she just was. She's like, I just none of your sisters had cribs. I wanted to get you a crib. <laughs> so, yeah, and in order to get the money, it was like, okay, let me do this real quick. You know, my mom was was really dope, though, in the sense of she ran her number spots. I don't know if back in the day you're familiar, but like it was these number spots that people go and like pay. And it's kind of like a raffle kind of thing. And mm -hmm. like the lottery. Yeah, lottery, mm -hmm. like the hood lottery kind of yeah. thing. And she she would do she'd work that out out of a laundry mat, you know, and make her a little hustle money and stuff like that. And then there's other ways to, you know, provide for us. But um, and my real father is. Um, played a part in it, you know. They were both in the, in the, in the well, streets. Well, she, he kind of like, instead of giving her the money, was like, hey, go do this for me and I'll give it to you. Okay. But it was definitely her going to handle something on behalf of my real father that, you know, she went to go do and got caught up in like literally in the midst of the moment of being there. So your mother gives birth to you in prison. Mm -hmm. And then how long were you <clears throat> there with her in prison as an infant? So a little bit after that, she was able to get bond or she was out on, on bond or bail, whatever. So for, but that was very short lived. Um, and then um, that's when my sister was able to kind of like have us for a little bit. And then um, before my mom went in to go do her official time time is when she, uh, she asked, of a mutual friend to kind of stay with us um, until she got back. And I actually just spoke to my, sister, my older sister about it yesterday. And she said, you know, my sister Lisa, she said one day she just, well, the woman eventually started dating a guy that was younger and was bringing him into our home. And my older sister was just not fond of it and just hated how he was starting to take over the house. So one day she said, I came home. She was like, I came, and this was the, you know, this is her like being a young girl trying to raise me, her sister. Um, my sister Linda also had my nephew very young. So we had my nephew in the mix as well. Um, she's trying to juggle it all while my mom was away. Has this lady that's supposed to be overseeing, you know, letting her stay with us because she had kids and nowhere to go. She eventually took advantage and tried to move a man in, and my sister just didn't have it. And she said one day she got pissed off, came home, threw all his shit out the window, and the lady got pissed and called ACS on us. And so. 
And that's when you were in foster care? Yeah. How long were you in foster care? Uh, I was able to have a two-year-old birthday party thrown by my sister. Um, I was still in the, um, I would say, okay, so I got out around six, uh, three, four, five. About like three and a half years. I always say this, it's for any child, but there's something about a young girl because I do feel like mothers shape their daughters. Mm -hmm. And for you to be born inside of a prison wall mm -hmm. in the prison system, and then to be transferred mm -hmm. to a foster care system all by the age of two, mm -hmm. and from two to six, the years where a little girl is supposed to get her mother's love and attention, you were being Molested. You were molested? In foster care, yeah. You were molested in foster care? I know for a fact my anger issues from in my adulthood came from my childhood. You know, you have these moments of like, okay, you're with this family and you're dealing with what you're dealing with, and then you have these visits with your family. And every visit I would just pray that I was going home officially and that wasn't the case so like after every visit you know being ripped from my mom to go back it built a lot of anger in me a lot and I used to remember going back to the house after the visit and I used to be so mad that I used to pinch myself because I was so mad that just having to just my family's here, but I couldn't. But over the years, you know what I think about? Is the kids that didn't even have those visits, that don't have those visits. Because I look back on my pictures and I'm like, oh, I was dressed pretty good for a kid in foster care. And then you look at the kids that I was in school or in the house with and they weren't, but they had to because there was, I had family that would come and check up with, you know, but there's kids in the system that no one checks up on them. So it's like, they're just forgotten about. And, um, yeah, I just, um, so I feel like those moments of like, and then you go back home and then, you know, the son of my foster mother touching me the way he was and this and, you know. How old was the guy who molested you? He was definitely in your teens. And it happened a lot. I was kept in a high chair a lot. <laughs> so I feel like just like not, um, as a kid, when things happen to you, you, you don't, you, you don't know how to explain to yourself everything's going to be okay. And I felt like, you know, just not knowing why I was going through what I was going through, just, you know, I used to pinch myself so much because I used to be so angry, especially, like, um, those visits from my mom. And you didn't they, tell they were like They were like, eventually. But as a kid, when you come to your mom, the last thing, I mean, and then at the same time, it's, I was in a situation of like, I was so young, I didn't know what was being done to me was really even wrong. So, um, the child, the, the, the foster care years were really, I feel like, um, ironically enough, played a big part in why, why I've, I've had a lot of like built up anger throughout the years where it's like you cross the line, I just, it's because as a kid, I, I never had, I never, was never able to release my anger and, and the frustration of like those visits. As much as I love them, the ending is what I dreaded the most. What you said is true in terms of at that age, because you were, you, I consider you to be, still be a toddler because you're so young and you don't know the words in terms of what is happening to me. You know it's not right. But you don't know how you to... You know it feels like... You know it doesn't make you feel good. Yeah. You just don't know. Am I supposed to speak on it because of this? Because it's not right? Like, And then back in those days, what, this was like early 90s? Like, it's not as talked about, you know? And then and, and me being as small as I was, who would have thought to say something? I mean, I look back at it now. I'm like, damn, I wish I would have. But oh, I didn't know. Well, I don't think you should blame yourself for that. <laughs> the, 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 thing is, the thing is this. That's why I said earlier the importance of, 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 the, of a, a young girl having a mom.
because when I, one thing I know about mothers, they prepare their daughters for these conversations. Someone touches you here, you tell me. Yeah. If someone does that. Yeah, I wasn't with my mom long enough in the beginning exactly. to even have those. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So you can't blame yourself for it because you didn't have the education from your mom mm -hmm. to be able to explain it to you. And you don't know what to say in terms of identifying what is happening to you. And one thing that you touched on that I would like to just um, bring up again is of course you did not tell your mother, because at the end of the day, you saw her in small doses. And in those small doses just, of time- I just want her to love on you me. Just, you just wanted your mom. I just want her to love on me. And I have pictures of, of me in foster care, like um, in our visits and stuff. And you can see in those photos, just like us and our embracement. And I'll send them over to you. Just like those were the times that were really rough for us as a family. You know, my sister Linda was, what, 14, 15, after having my nephew at 13. He was also with me as well, which thankfully, they kept us together. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it, our family has definitely been through it, you know, starting from my mom and how she's, you know, so it's, I didn't come into this easy. <laughs> Where was your father at around this time? Eventually he got deported. Drugs. <laughs> He's still over there in Dominican Republic, so, yeah. But that's, my blood father is not who I consider to be my real father. My real father comes later. <laughs> mm. So. How later does he come into your life? You are, um, you... Right when my mom is in the halfway house. <laughs> yes, he was a counselor. And um, they fell in love, and and. How old were you then? Oh gosh, how old was I? I want to say like seven, eight. Mm. This is like right fresh us, mommy just getting us back. Um, but that man changed our life forever in a great way, you know. Um, now that, that was my dad, and he took care of me, and he raised me, and. And there was never once that I did not feel I was his, wasn't his daughter. And to this day, there's no telling me that's not my father. So my mom eventually, you know, got out. We got, got us. Um, and from there, life, as far as childhood, became really, ironically, just great. My, my mom was always a party goer, so my house was always the house in the neighborhood that was the revolving door. Everybody and their mama came over to cook or clean. I mean, my mom cooked, so everybody and their mama came over to cook, I mean, to eat, sorry. And it was just an infused household. My mom had a job working with um, people with cerebral palsy. So her um, patients and her clients became our family members. So I grew up with not only a diverse, you know, surrounding of races and you know, people, but also um, we loved on, on individuals that had, you know, birth defects that for us was like, you know, so very early on, I learned to just embrace people no matter what the hell they look like. And in growing up in New York and the Bronx neighborhood at 840 on the Grand Concourse, you know, we had everybody in their mama at our house. And that was good. It was the good old days. It was either us listening to, you know, Machata Morengue or Mary J and, you know, Jodeci, depending on which sister was, you know, taking over the radio. But our house was always full of music. We were always dancing. And that's when I started to um, love life in the sense of listening to music and, and being in this surround, these surroundings. My sisters were real hip into like the dance moves of what was in and we would have dance parties and, and I ended up being the kid that my sisters would bring to house parties so I can win the dance contest and we go home with money. Like I was really that kid. Like I just loved music, loved to dance and you know my childhood from there became like a childhood. And I no longer had to think about what happened to me. So even when my mom got me back, I never spoke on the things that happened to me in foster care until I got older. Mm. So because life just got great. So it was like, I, I, and then again, still, I didn't know I was supposed to say yeah. anything. And like you say, your, your, who you consider to be your father now, he 
came to your life, he saved you essentially, mm -hmm. and you were able to understand the foundation of family. Oh my God, yeah. And I was able to understand what it's like for a man to love a little girl, which is very important. So even though I didn't have that early on with my real father, my, my blood father, I should say, mm -hmm. my real father gave me that. What you also got was a modeling contract as a teenage woman. Mm -hmm. um, was it a J-Lo lookalike contest or something? So, okay, so after a while, it just became, I know what I want to do with my life. J-Lo was like the biggest thing out there. And I was like, wait a minute, she looked like me, she's from where I'm from, she started where I start. like, this is where she started, she took the same train that I take to go to school every day. You were on the six? I took the D to the six. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like, it was, it was, it was those times, well, even before that, because like I said, my mom always used to have music playing in the house and stuff. So we would have our, you know, different genres playing. And um, but the first time ever my mom made me watch West Side Story is when I was like, I want to sing, I want to dance, I want to be on TV, I want to, I want to just do it all as a little girl. So that's what made me start wanting to do the dance and stuff. And I would, and I've gotten so good at reggae. Um, you know, literally, I would be at reggae parties, this little Spanish girl, part, like literally going all the way back because I was super flexible and studying on all these dance hall queens that were there, like, you know, and I would get my little money because it was like, who's this little Spanish girl and how she know how to dance like that? So I, you know, and that was the stuff that I was like, yeah. So I was, in, I was fueled very early on by different cultures and like music and my sisters being so in the know of like what was hip and you know, we're around the way girls. We're in the heart of New York City where hip hop was made. So, you know, that's what we were fueled, that's all we know. So, so West Side Story put the light bulb on and then yeah, it was like, okay, I started uh, junior high school and I got my first working card and when once I got that you couldn't tell me I wasn't grown I got my first job at Dunkin Donuts then after that came Holiday Inn then I worked at Justice so anyway so I was making my money and as soon as I started making my money I started to like save up being able to like buy myself nice things Jordans this and a third I'm like wait a minute I fell in love with the the like the whole I make money I get to take care of myself have nice things and this that, and a third okay so how do I do this do this, but doing what I want to do. And then bam, J-Lo came on the scene and it was like, oh, that's how you do it. So it was like the map of like, okay, this is what I want to do. And I actually have a visual of someone doing it. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, doing what I do and I would go down to the train station every morning and look for Backstage, which was a newspaper back in the day. Yes. Backstage. So Backstage is this newspaper in New York City. I don't yes. know if LA has it. They but used to. Back there. day, they, it was all I over. I lived in New York around the same time. Yeah. So, and they would have advertisements and auditions. And auditions for calls. like everything, commercials, this, yes. down and third. So that's when I started to, you know, really like get out there with, with, and then eventually it was like, I want to go on this casting. I was during school hours, so I started skipping school to go to castings. And that's what started my whole thing. And the next thing you know, I got offered a contract by just skipping school one day and going to auditions, random. I would pick one day out of the week so I wouldn't get caught because my mom would beat my ass. One day out of the week where I would just go on auditions. And it would be the day that I would find the most auditions in that day, according to Backstage. And I would just go all over the place. And, and eventually, you know, MTV started doing castings and MySpace and all that stuff coming on. So MTV started posting castings on their website. And that's how I got a chance to do, like, Say What Karaoke and Want to Be J-Lo. And got a chance to do all those little things. And, yeah, and that fueled everything I fucking needed to say, okay, I'm going to be a big shit. Like, I'm going to be the shit. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I was going to be the shit. And there was no way around it. You wasn't going to tell me nothing. You know, and even, it's funny because 
my family knew I was doing stuff because, you know, the contract and all of that stuff. But I don't think they ever really took it seriously, even though my cousin Maritza was uh, married to David Allen Greer and she was like a big fuel for his career. Yeah. Ooh, um, she was that. she was like she made David Allen Greer at the time. Probably she was like holding all. So outside of that, my family didn't know. Like, what are you doing? So only Maritza was the only one that was in the Hollywood world. So, you know, them seeing me want to be, they, they, I was, they probably didn't think anything of it, you know? This young girl, like, okay, you want to be J-Lo? Okay, okay, mommy, okay, you know? <laughs> but, um, yeah, and that's kind of how I started, and it was just wasn't, and then it just kind of just kept going from there. Yeah, because you started doing music videos. Yeah, the music videos came after, so I started meeting more casting directors. And then um, they would submit me, and then every time I was submitted for a music video, I got hired. Every single time. So that's what came, was the music videos. And then I started doing them, and then I was able to make a little video name for myself, and then I was able to do like party host things back in the days, you know. They used to hire us because we were on the magazine and all of this and all of that. And, you know, you can make a quick $500 just to party. And, yeah. So and I was young you, as f too. And here you are with no guidance from, like, you know, a big sister, you know, the parents, no momagers, you yeah. know, none of that. You, 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 you had it in you. And you started to make a name for yourself in New York City, which is a tough market to break in. At what moment in the earlier days of your career did you say, oh bitch, you made it? I don't think I've ever still, I don't think I've ever said that to myself. Even today? Mm -mm. Even today you don't think you made it? Uh-uh, I'm not done. I know I have so much more to accomplish, so. And I only get teary because, God willing, I can actually accomplish all of those things. So, I don't think I made it yet. <laughs> it's nice, the thought, because everything I don't been through, you think like, shit, <laughs> give me a break, right? But I don't think, I don't, I've never said that. The acting, the, the TV roles, the There's so being, much being more. able to travel. And Especially now, I feel like with all this stuff that's happened, I feel like I have a lot more work to do. Are you afraid of not being able to accomplish stuff based on what's been happening lately? Not based on what's happening lately, but you just never know. We know life is lifing, nothing is promised. So, but I'm not fearful because as godly as I am more than ever, um, it's all in his hands, but yeah, like I, I, I always pray, like especially for my kids, I wanna be able to, as much as I got a lot of explaining to do, I wanna be able to be like, well, this, all of this happened and, and, and explain it the way I need to, but I also need something to show for it. Mm -hmm. For my kids. I just want them to. To genuinely be proud of me. Are you proud of you? Yeah. Okay. That I am. Okay, good. That I am. Because, good. especially with the last three years and how everything happened in my life with, you know, <laughs> um, mental health is serious. You know, you have good days and you have bad days. So I'm proud of myself because the bad days have been But I pushed my self through. That's what I'm happy and proud of. Because I'm here. And you're still standing. Yeah, because there's days you don't want to be here. Let's face it, sometimes you, with all the stuff you deal with, especially being scrutinized, like I've been on TV, reality TV, let's say 15 years, I want to say, you know. You've had days where you did not want to be here on Earth? I've had days where I'm like, F I don't want to be me. I wouldn't say I don't want to be on Earth, but like, F I don't want to be me. This is too much. Like, I need a break. Who, who the f 
wants to be someone 24 seven that's always having to go through so much. But at the same time, I'm like, shit. I'm supposed to be me. <laughs> so it's like, who wants to be? Like, I'm supposed to be me. Even being a, a teenage mom yourself, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wanna, I wanna go, go there now in terms of, here you are, girl, like, won the JLo contest, <laughs> you know, you're, you're on your way, you're a music video girl at the height of what it meant in the early 2000s to be, and I was in New York City at that mm -hmm. time, and. I was like in all the hottest videos. Smooth magazines. Magazines, yeah. I was definitely things. doing the damn thing. No manager, no guidance, no nothing. My mom maybe once or twice came to a Smooth magazine shoot and, you know, um, was cheering me on, but you know, the fundamentals of like the business, you know, and all of that stuff, no, that was just me pure winging it. Uh, for a very, 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 very long time. And then... And then you got pregnant. Yeah, and I didn't even know I was pregnant for like... I didn't know I was pregnant with King until about well, like going on six months. What? I had my period and everything. <laughs> yeah. How Ironically enough, years later, the same thing happened with Legend. I had no idea I was pregnant. I was getting my period and no symptoms and the whole damn baby. Dr. Jackie went, put the thing on it, the whole baby face, like, hey. It's, I have that video to this day, it's so funny. And it's like, my two boys, they didn't want me to know they were coming. Uh, you had King, how old were you when you had King? Uh, 18. You were 18 years old. And then old. I had him at, no, I was pregnant at 18, had him at 19. And the child's father, yes. was he in the streets? I wouldn't say he was in the streets, he's very respected. He was very respected in the, in yeah. the streets. Like Raul was definitely respected and um, feared. <laughs> but that's what I loved. I loved that. So you met him. I love a man that can't be fucked with. So Raul, you meet this man. He's respected in the streets. That First day I met him, I was on a private flight to see Eva Queen perform in Puerto Rico, and that is like really what changed. Like, oh, you see an Evie Queen in person, her nails, her persona, the way people just flock to her and just the star quality and the, I was like, wait a minute, I get it now. For, like that was my first female encounter that someone that made it that I grew up you know, mm -hmm. idolizing and like, oh, you the queen. She, and she gave me the, without even realizing, I was just there studying her that whole damn day that, that we were in Puerto Rico and I was, I went back to the States like, okay, yeah, I'm going to be big shit. Somewhere, <laughs> somehow, I'm gonna be it. So yeah, I met him, lean back video. Um, and we, it's funny because as toxic as our relationship was, it was also very fun. I spent my days partying in Miami, living my best life, going to the beach every, every day, going back to the club at night. It was just, and this is back in the day when like DJ Khaled was at um, Privé and like mansion was open and you had club bed and believe it or not, um, who you call that big beach and then we're out in the scene. So, you know, it was, it was a good time. It's a good time. I was young, but it was a good time. And I was just in the life officially with him. But he also introduced me to a lot of opportunities that led me into where I'm at now. So even though our relationship was so toxic, if it wasn't for him, you know, putting me in position to do the Courtney and Chloe Take Miami show, that's how you got it? Yeah, well, he's really good friends with Scott Disick from growing up in New York. Scott is a New Yorker. So we're really good friends with Scott and me being, you know, Raul's girlfriend, we already lived in Miami. It was like, no brainer. And when they come to town, we would hang out with Courtney and Scott. So it was like, okay, you know? So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I had my, I had my baby. Um, I didn't know I was pregnant, found out. I hid my whole pregnancy um, when I was pregnant with King. More so because I, didn't know, I knew I didn't have shit. I didn't have a pot to piss in. 
obviously there was no other option. I have to keep my baby. And there, there wasn't going to be no, you know, even though I didn't want kids. I didn't want kids ever just because I saw the struggle of my sisters and what I went through and all that. So when I got pregnant, I, it took me a while to even be okay with being pregnant. So I was in hiding most of the time. And then remember, too, I was like this little video girl doing the damn thing. And, you know, I didn't want my pregnancy to kind of, because at that time, that's what it was. You had to be a bad bitch. Da, da, da. <laughs> like, yeah. Pregnancy, what? We, they didn't, we didn't celebrate pregnancy back in those days. Yeah. So anyway, so I had my son, and that was a lot because obviously I didn't have a pot to piss in. But having King... really set the tone for how I would hustle moving forward, having him. Because as a young mom, you don't realize, mm, the layers to being a mom, I should say. I just worried most about providing and I wanted him to just always have what he wanted, what he needed, especially because I'm a big believer in like, when you have kids, they didn't ask to be here. So if you have these kids, you better do right by them. And that's kind of like what my mentality was when I had my baby. Um, and he was always such a, he was a good baby. He hardly cried. Um, I breastfed him. I was very proud of that, being um, and so into like breastfeeding my baby, and where everyone around me was like, eh, breastfeeding, you don't feel weird, eh, because you know, small-minded in our urban eyes, give baby formula, call it a day. But I was the one that was breastfeeding my baby, and I took, I took a lot of pride in that. That was like one of the things I feel like. Um, that really bonded me with him the most because it was like, okay, like I'm, I brought you here, I'm taking care of you, and how you're surviving is coming from within me, and now my job is to provide and give you the best life. And whatever it took, I made sure to always give King. everything he wanted, everything he needed, and eventually when he was old enough to start school, what was important was for him to be in a stable environment. Um, eventually I left his dad. It got to that point, it was just too much. And when I left his dad, I, you know, got caught up in another relationship <laughs> right after. Um, but it was my first time out in the world, just me and my baby, for real, as a grown-ass woman, <laughs> like for real. Mm -hmm. So my hustle changed because of my son. My like the the, it was like things had to have a, a purpose. Like if I'm gonna do this, it's because I'm getting like nothing was. It wasn't no more bullshitting like I'm not doing this just to be seen I'm not you know I buckled down for the first time I should say in like taking my shit serious because I have someone that needs this to go right mm -hmm. <laughs> we need this to work so and did you have support like did your mom help raise him a sister or was it just the two of you yeah um and it's funny because I read so many things about my son from blogs everywhere that's hurtful. Um, but I, I, I was a young mom. And at one point, when I officially got signed to Love & Hip Hop, I was not living in New York. I was living in LA. So the beginning years, it was Monday through Friday in New York filming, fly out Red Eye Friday just to see my son for two days, fly back out Monday to finish out the week come back Friday. So that was our structure for a long time. Who was, who was watching him? So at first it was my mom. Okay. Um, so it's really my mom and my sister. 
Um, but my older sister, Linda, plays a big part in um, helping me fuel King's mind and um, keeping him, how you say that, because um, he's so smart. Mm -hmm. So stimulated. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. plays a big part in like helping me um, be on top of King's education and providing him with the best schools. King has always been very, very intelligent <laughs> to the point. There was days where I would get called into school because King was correcting the teacher. So King got in trouble because he was correcting the teacher. Was King right? Yes, but the teacher was embarrassed, so they had to reprimand him in some ways, but that was the most of my troubles with my baby. Um, so yeah, so in the beginning, my mom, and I actually made her retire from working with UCP so that she no longer has to work. I have the peace of mind growing up the way I grew up. You didn't want, got it. You didn't want him being raised by some strangers because you didn't want him to go through what you went through. I got it. So you retired your mother and said, I will work on Love and Hip Hop on Monday through Friday to make enough money to send back And home. I wasn't even making enough money. I just oh, I knew. Know. Yeah, you don't make I just money. knew yeah. that was going to do something. I didn't know what, but I knew it was going to do something, you know? So I made my mom retire, which means now I have more responsibilities. I have two grown women and a son. So my mom, you know, came in and then eventually, you know, my sister gets involved. Um, she is, um, she's very intelligent herself. Um, so she was able to come in and help me on days where my mom, you know, my mom's much older. So um, it's an equal balance, basically. And I want to, I, I, I don't <laughs> I just wanted to explain that because I feel like all parties should be equally praised, both my mom and my sister, because I could not have done that without them. Um, but is it the whole that I read, your son was just left with his grandma in the middle of, I don't know what kind of country they think, and I just am not a mom to him. No, it's just reality or entertainment, I bounce around. My son deserves stability, the same school, the same friend, the same, you know, he needs stability, familiar, like he needs a foundation and, and that was important to me. I didn't want to, you know, lug him here, lug him there. I want him to always have something that was familiar. You broke up with your, with, with the child's father, so you're feeling for yourself and there, there's something to be said about that, especially knowing that you don't want, he wasn't raised by a bunch of strangers. He wasn't raised mm -hmm. going from house to house. Mm -hmm. he, was, he had a stable environment mm -hmm. with his grandmother. Mm -hmm. And my sister. Your sister and, and then, you. And, and, and yeah, and then yeah. It, there's also other people implemented in that because my family is so big. But what's common though, in most Caribbean homes, whether you're Jamaican or whether you're Spanish, whether you're you know, Haitian, whatever, grandmas, aunties, all play a part in raising the kids. It's not just solely, like we all collectively, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not uncommon, at least for us, for the family to, to kind of tap in and, and help you and, and so on and so forth. So no. Um, I also want to clear, um, for whatever reason, I guess because my son is not the most hippest kid and very introvert and he's very to himself. Um, at the wedding, you know, he's very shy. He's not into the cameras. People assume that there's something, you know, birth-wise wrong with him. And, and Wait, people are trying to self-diagnose well, I've, him? I've, I've, yeah, I've read blogs. There's actually long blogs that will sit there. Well, there's, I literally put out stories that my son is autistic and I'm embarrassed of his, you know, or that he's handicapped in some type of way. And So I just, for those who read these kind of things and probably have this assumption, because for whatever reason, the, the curiosity of my son and why he, I choose not to have him on TV, 
his privacy and what he wants of me and what I'm granting him is not okay for people. They have not been okay with, okay, her son just doesn't want to be on TV. She's respecting his wishes. So people come up with these crazy scenarios about my son, some of which have gotten back to him and they're hurtful, you know? So, and it, it and if my son was, that's not a reason to hide him and that's not a reason why I would not show him. It just so happens King is very vocal on not wanting to be in a public eye. When he used to be on TV, and that was very like quick, because I didn't even do that you know, long or much, um, going to school, parents want to take pictures. Hey, you're Erica Mena's son, you want a picture? That's not the type of attention kids want to go to school, mm -hmm. especially when they're hanging out with their friends or friends looking at them. You know, it's like, so believe it or not, there's, parents that overstep their boundaries in school because they know who this kid belongs to that have made my son feel this type of way, which understandably he has every right to. So once he was vocal with me and his father about not wanting to be in the public eye anymore, we gave him that, you know, wish. And every so often we'll ask him, you know, like, like I have Christmas photos that you might, I might post online just with me and the little ones, but I have the versions with all of my kids, I just can't post it because he doesn't want and it. And how old is he now? He's 16, graduating this year, high school. He's graduating high school at 16. Yeah. I'm so proud. So proud. That I'll say I made it. Yeah. In that one. subject, I made it to a certain extent. Because what people don't realize is the time I missed from having to provide, I could never get back with my kid. So naturally, I'm always going to have that regret. But at the same time, I look around and I'm like, he's, he's never wanted for anything. He's gone to the best schools. He's loved on. I sacrificed a lot of time away from him to provide and get comfortable enough where I'm at. But I can't ever get that time back. So it hurts when people are like, oh, she abandoned her kid or. There's people who say he doesn't like you. Yeah. That your, your son doesn't like you. <laughs> He's embarrassed that you're his mother. Um, and that's the narrative because of him not wanting to be on TV, mm. but you know, truth be told, teenagers, if, if anybody knows how to raise them with all these insane, unnecessary topics that they're having to be forced to deal with, and yet they're supposed to be still outside playing, please hand it to me because I may not always be his favorite, because I'm just like, you're not going to make certain decisions until you're old enough. And kids don't want to hear, especially when they feel they know it all. And when you have a kid that's extremely smart, <laughs> he likes to debate with me a lot. Yeah, but um, yeah, I just, it's, it's, I wanted to clear that because I feel like this is a kid that he didn't ask me to be his mom. Does he probably think I'm a, I wish I was a, a lot more not known or they didn't come with all the stuff? I'm sure because he's such an introvert. You know, he, he likes calm and quiet and total opposite of me. Um, because the thing is, I, and, and the reason why I'm not even going to ask a lot about him is because, number one, he's a minor. Um, and I respect the fact that he is private. And when I interviewed NeNe Leakes, um, months ago, and I talked to her about her kids being on TV and her oldest son going through his struggles. And I asked her, like, do you think it was the, the reality show? And she said, I don't know, maybe. She said, look, it didn't help. It did not help. Yeah. And your parent is Erica Mena. Yeah. You know, ferocious and controversial, and they can Google you that... I don't think people understand the degree of the teasing that occurs 
to children who are products of reality stars. Your mom is or a dad is a reality star. If they on TV, knocking if you bucket, throwing drinks, cussing somebody out, you know, that travels to school because that, that child's friend may be watching it with their parents and they're hearing the, yeah. what their parents are saying yeah. about But thankfully, my child has gone to school where, believe it or not, it's like these kids are... Their parents ain't watching my fucking life. Okay. <laughs> but it's the day-to-day, -day, him walking to the library. Oh, it's that stuff, yeah. It's him going to the mall, you know, and he's been in comfortable situations where he's been spotted and, and doesn't want that type of attention. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it's weird. I honestly don't know why people are so obsessed with wanting to talk about my son and my relationship with him, especially because it's not something that I've ever been extremely vocal about. And I think what's even more weird is that I have to talk about it when I'm not supposed to. Like this is a kid that wants privacy. Yeah. Why is that so hard to understand? Yeah. When, when you guys see him at the wedding, you guys saw him. I mean, you know, we actually did scenes together that was never used, you know, for that special. Um, me and my son, you know, that was never. So he's around. He's just doesn't like the forefront. And if you do see him, it's because we got his permission that day. <laughs> and like a kid. And, and, and yeah. They, they one yeah. day I'm able to do it the next day. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it changes. It changes. Yeah. Uh, but no, and, I, and I want to respect his privacy, so I want to move on from that. Um, Love and Hip Hop is arguably um, the breakout moment for you in terms of how everybody immediately knew this Erica Mena is the one to be reckoned with, and you instantly became a household name. How did you get on Love and Hip Hop? Because the first time we, the audience, met you, Miss Thing, it was season two of Love and Hip Hop New York. Was it season two? It was Yikes. season two. Like season two was off the chain. Yandy, Chrissy, Kimbella, Erica Mena, um, Emily. Oh my God, Emily. Emily, and of course Olivia. And we were first introduced to you season two. It was like this girl's outing, like a dinner or lunch or something. Okay, before we even get into that. Yes, what happened? Because that was your introduction. So here I am. I got $1,500. I am ready to start movies. I'm like, I, J, like I told you, J-Lo put this battery in my back. I'm like, Ooh, you know, I met Evie Queen. So I'm like, I'm inspired. I'm, I'm like, this is, I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Like I'm telling, this is what's in my mind. I'm, I'm going to be somebody. I'm going to be big. I'm going to be on J-Lo's level. I, I, Whatever it's, I'm getting there. I was even like writing down, like I need to find me a Benny Medina. Okay, so that's yeah. I I, I found manager, I yes. found a Benny Medina, but she's a woman. So anyway, <laughs> took me many years after, but we found them. Okay, yes. so anyway, um, I have fifteen hundred dollars, and I hit up my cousin Maritza and I said, I want to start doing movies. What should I do? She's like, you have to put together some type of EPK just so, you know, you can try to get an agent. Like, you can't just say you're going to do movies. Blah, blah, blah. So my cousin gave me a little 411. When I tell you I spent $1,500, had a whole bunch of music videos that I did chopped up with like videos that I had of me behind the scenes at music uh, and photo shoots. I have no idea what the fuck. I was just like, oh, okay, just what I got to do, put together a montage of what I've done. Okay, let's do this. Did that and had the nerve to do a voiceover over it. Okay? <laughs> you know all of the lights, how the Kanye West song starts, yes. all of the lights, and it's the violin. So I used the beginning part of that song to start this EPK. Anyway, sent the whole shit. I sent this EPK out to every body. Uh, I got information from backstage. Um, I finally uh, went on MTV, got their office building number and just was emailing and sending co hard copies of this to every person I could think of, right? Even sent one to Benny Medina. I wonder if he got it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so 
It gets picked up, I guess, by Mona Scott. Don't ask me how. She probably won't tell me either. Um, I got a call. Now, mind you, this is the prime of reality television. Okay. Evelyn Lozado was it. Is it. Like, she, I mean, I'm, I'm going to call her like it is. If it wasn't for Evelyn Lozado being on Basketball Wives, the thought of casting a Latina in general for Love and Hip Hop probably would have never been a thought. Mm. Maybe down the line. I mean, I won't say that. Emily. Oh, uh, Emily. Yeah, 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 yeah. Emily's so poised. She's such a, so, a classy. A okay. She's such a classy, soft, super sophisticated woman. Emily's in her own realm of yes. royalty. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. I'm talking around the way, girl. Evelyn Rosado set the tone of, so if it wasn't for that, because that's what it was. Mona was on the hunt for her Evelyn Rosado. <laughs> so I actually, I actually love the fact that people compare us because I feel like it's the truth. Like we're both from the Bronx. We we've we grew up infused in the streets of New York where no matter where you come from, what you look like, you know, we were all, we are all one in New York. That's how we're raised. That's how we grow up. Now, granted, you know, it is what it is, but um, she called me. They flew me in to New York. So I sat down with Mona and Stephanie Gale. Stephanie Gale's my heart. I could have not Honestly, I don't think I would have been able to even get through my first years of Love and Hip Hop had I not had Stephanie Gale mm. and Vivian Gomez. Yes. Vivian Gomez is like, is she still there? I don't think so, no. No, I don't think Vivian. so. Vivian. Yeah. yeah. So, met them in the office. That night, they took me to do that scene with me and Yandy in the restaurant. Wasn't signed, no lawyer talk, no nothing. We, they put me on camera, like, they fell in love with me instantly. Same day they met me, same day. I so wait, me. the same day you met them, mm -hmm. hours later, you're filming. With Yandy, yeah, that with, scene with us at dinner? Yes. Where I'm like, my titties is dead. Yeah, that was my first day being met, yeah. The same outfit and everything, yeah. Wow. The next day is when the whole Kimbella shit happened. So what was going on with that that, I mean, it was the first fight of the season. Yeah. So I met Yandy the day that I met Mona. We shot that dinner scene. The next day I get called to hang out with Yandy so we get to know each other more. Because remember, I wanted to do music, right? Mm -hmm. J Lo, E B Queen, yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm following. Yes. So, um, damn. Okay. So, next day, we're all over the city. They got me, I guess, Yandy shopping, and I'm just like, okay, this is me trying to get to know her. Cool. <sighs> Miss Messy Yandy. She plays a big part. In what happened with Kim Bella and I? Yeah, totally. So that day of us getting to know each other, mm -hmm. she brought up to me that she mentioned me to Kim Bella and she had all this shit to say. So I don't know if you, well, I'm sure you do. You remember when we go back to that scene when Kim Bella's like, you don't even know me. I'm like, bitch, I don't even know you. I'm like, bitch, yes, you know me. You've been fucking my money. So I was already in vengeance because I'm thinking, this bitch has been talking shit about me. So wait, so when you, right before you and Kimbella met. met, Yandy is in your ear. Yeah, like, oh, I told, you, I told Kimbella about you. What's up with y'all? Why she has so much to say about y'all, blah, blah, blah. And it was just, yeah, there you go. So you came in already on God. Because I'm thinking, and mind you, let me, can I be honest with you? I've never said this out loud. When I came into this, I really thought this shit was like wrestling. Fake? <laughs> well, like, you, you go in. You know, do your performance, and then that's it. It's like you just make the show. You leave it on the stage, <laughs> and you go home. You're like, block it out. So, 
Yeah, I didn't go into this having a game plan either. I don't know what the f I was doing. You gotta remember, they literally just called me. I flew to New York to me, like, this is one season of Love and Hip Hop. We got basketballs already. So I'm over here thinking this is like the new way of wrestling, but not actual chairs, you know, just go at it, whatever, say what you say, you go about your way. So when I came at her aggressively, I just thought, this is what you do. This is my character. <laughs> I got me a little, you know, like, because in real time, honestly, between me, I don't think I would have gone at her that crazy. So the thing is this. I, I want to I go back a little bit. Number one, obviously, your goal is like, I'm the next J-Lo. So yes. Acting, movie. Yes. I study yes. acting, whatever. And here I go, get a call randomly. You got a, a random call. Yand is in your ear telling you. I mean, before that, you're watching Bass, my wives. You love Evelyn. She's another Bronx girl, Spanish girl. You're like, okay, I like what she's doing. You then meet Yandy, Mona the rest of the executives. Then you're in a scene. Yandy Next day. tells you, girl, blah, 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 got you all amped up. So then when you see Kim Bella, you're like, oh, I get this is what we do. do. So that's why you were so hard in the paint. And honestly, I didn't really think I was. In the time of it, I'm just like, oh, you had a lot to say to, I'm here now kind of thing. Like, what's up? Now, mind you, I've seen Kim Bella at that time in passing because of what we do in music videos and things of that nature and things of, so like, I knew of her, but not to go at her for no reason. But in TV world, me sitting down, it was perfect. There was no backstory to that because no one saw what Yandy was telling me. Obviously that was off camera. I didn't know how that shit worked. So I just went in there like, oh, this bitch been talking shit about me. I'm going to check her. Not the smartest crayon, obviously, in that moment because I didn't know what the f I was doing. So when y'all were tussling, did you? Did you that part was obviously real. No, no, no. Not, 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 not that that wasn't real, but like, <laughs> did, did you? So I you, was like, oh, shit, you, this you, is wrestling, all right. You didn't That's think what I thought. to that. So y'all, because I remember, listen. I'm a fan of, a of, of, of the show. I remember it was like this. <laughs> and it was like hair and, and, and heels. And I thought you were like a, a green jumpsuit or something. Uh, it was a horrible gold jumpsuit. Gold jumpsuit. And, then... and, and you know what was worse about it? It was not even, for, like it made my ass look so flat and like just, it was just all <laughs> wrong. But that's how you know, like I didn't know what the f*** I was doing. I was just like, yo, I have an opportunity and I need to be present and make my presence known. Well, girl, you did. So what happened after that fight? So after that fight was backlash, and that's when I was like, oh, shit, this ain't, this ain't wrestling. I'm assuming after that, you got a contract. <laughs> Wait, bitch. Just sign right here, honey. Ah! <laughs> sign right here. Don't worry about Is it. Is that your Moda Sky Young boy? Just sign right here. <laughs> but I had to sign right here. Um... In the van. Not the white van. The white van. Right after this fight happened. How much was your per episode fee when you signed the contract? Let's just put it like this. I wasn't even getting paid per episode. I was getting per diem and my expenses paid. Yeah. I was the guinea pig. Oh, man. They saw me coming. Wait, stop the presses. They saw me coming. See they, they saw a hungry young girl that came into the offices like, what's up? I'm ready. I'm this. I'm that. And just knew I was hungry and devoted enough to be present without even having to talk about logistics of paperwork, needing a, a lawyer, nothing. They saw my ass coming. Yeah. I could talk about it now because what, y'all fired me, right? Allegedly. <laughs> so you did not get paid a per episode fee. You got per diem because you weren't living in New York City. And, and legally, when you're working out of state, you at least got to get per diem. And that runs about $40 per day. And just so you guys know, per diem, when you're in the business, you get um, around 40 or 50 bucks per day. And that money is to like, you know, buy snacks, buy food, water, gum. Yeah. So you were making that? Yeah. 
Yeah. And I was locked into that for some time. So they played me like an extra and was using me like a main character. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I met Deanna years later. Because even after that, like, there was nothing, like, when I became cool enough with Rich and I, you know, he even tried to help me, you know, get a better contractual situation and, it, you know, you just locked in, you had to wait it out. And then eventually, you know, you bring in numbers, people love you, then they, so, yeah, I was the guinea pig for a lot of stuff. Because if you don't, I don't know if you remember, but they, they, they casted this woman that was saying that she was, like, my madam, I guess, my pimp at one point. The white girl. Yes. Chrissy or something. Yes. Okay. And I just feel like the fact that they allowed this woman to lie and say that I was a prostitute is complete defame. Like, you literally defamed my character for a storyline for someone that wasn't even credible, for a story that was fabricated and maliciously put together just so she can have a little spot on the show. And I had to deal with that. Like, people were really... Like, and that was around the time I was dating... Or, breaking up with Sin and it's Rich and Sin were, you know, kind of in cahoots and they were having conversations with this woman about me being a prostitute. And it's like, where is the proof of this? I've never, you know, so I feel like, and I'm not saying this because I want anybody to feel bad for me because I've been there, done that, but I definitely was used in the worst way when it comes to this franchise where a lot of things weren't considered when it came to me. And that's why, you know, I've been misunderstood so on this platform for so long. It's like, you had me on this platform, coming on this new girl, yeah, I started beef and da-da-da, whatever, but you clearly see I, I'm inspiring, I'm, I'm an inspiring artist or actress and this, that, and a third, and you're gonna allow this random woman that you feel is needed for the show with this fake story that's really not true, like saying that I'm a pro, and that's something that like, middle America, which is most of our, mm -hmm. Our, our consumers and our watchers, they don't know the difference. They, they, you, you, anything that's said on TV, people believe it. Anything that's said on blogs, people believe it. So for a long time, I had to, for a while, I had to deal with people thinking I was at one point a prostitute, which was fuck. People think your body <laughs> count is very high. They think you slept with a lot of people. What's crazy? It's Raul, DJ Envy, Rich, Sin. Um, Damn, what came after sin? Bow. What came after bow? You? <laughs> um, came after bow safari, right? Yeah. No, cliff. Oh, cliff. Yeah. Safari. Because I'm not afraid to be sexual. I, first of all, I love talking about sex. It's one of my favorite subjects. You're a Scorpio. <laughs> I'm a Scorpio. And I'm very... What did Wendy Williams said? I was sexually fluid. Is that a good way? I think so. <laughs> You're talking to a gay man, so yes, I think being sexually fluid is fine. <laughs> I go with, the, see, and then that's the crazy thing too. To actually have sex with me, I have to be into you. Because when I have sex, honey, I have sex. So I want to be able to have my fun. If I'm going to waste my time, honey, I'm going to waste my time. So for me, but at the same time, that being that, I have, it, I don't mind flirting. I don't mind wearing what I want to wear. I am, like I said, I'm comfortable with talking about all subjects of sex. I'm also very open, spontaneous, and I'm vocal about all that. And as you guys have seen, I'm not afraid to love who I love. If it's a woman, I'm going to love the f out of her. If it's a man, I'm going to love the f out of him. And also think, and, and I think prior to what Chrissy was saying on Love and, and, love and Hip Hop, Obviously, I feel like your first scandal was people said you were a mistress in DJ Envy's marriage. Yeah, because that came out right when I got on Love and Hip Hop. And we had just broken up because the wife found out, which I was totally oblivious. I knew about the kids. Mind you, I have a kid, but I have a big daddy. And it's more common where we come from to have kids, but you're not married. You just got a baby mama or a baby daddy. So I knew about the kids, and it was always told to me as his kid's mother. Never wife. And I didn't get that realization until I got the phone call. From the wife? From the wife. 
she called you. Mm-hmm. I bet they didn't say that on the radio. DJ Envy's wife called you and said what? Um, hi, this is Gia Casey. Is this Erica Mena? I said yes. She was like, are you and Rashawn? And I'm like, Rashawn? I'm like, who's this? His wife. And I remember this day because I was in New York City with a friend of mine. It was her birthday, and Envy was DJing that night. So we were actually getting ready at a hotel for my friend's birthday to meet up with him, who's DJing in the city, to enjoy her birthday. <sighs> that was like such. So coming out, okay, and then I just left King's father. This was my first relationship from that. And right away, he showered me with money, gifts, trips. Envy did. Yeah. How did you meet him? Uh, through a mutual friend at a strip club called Jersey Girls. Yeah, he was a DJ every night. I was hosting that night. That's how we met. And he approached you? Well, a, fr a mutual friend. Okay. I saw him in the DJ booth. I was like, damn, he's cute. And I told the girl that we're mutual friends with. And she's like, oh, that's my brother. Come here. And even, not even she told me he was married. Did she know he was married? I mean, Envy never walked around with rings or anything like that. You know what's the real key key? I've actually partied with the whole breakfast club right before they got the actual breakfast club. It was like the lead up. Partied with all of them. Charlotte made it. And oh, Angelie. Oh, girl, Angelie done had a few shots with the weirdo. <laughs> she called you a weirdo? No, I'm calling her one. Oh, you're hanging out with him, some of the breakfast yeah, club people. Yeah, so, no, no, no. Let's go back. Go ahead. I call him. I literally, when she said his wife, I hung the phone call Envy, and he's panicking. Please, don't say nothing. I have to save half of everything. She's taking, she's going to try to take away everything from me. Please, 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 please. I have to try to, just don't say anything. Don't pick up no calls, da 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 da, -da. So I'm over here. I've never been in this situation. Here's this man that's been dolting over me, showering me. You know, I'm starting to fall for him. I spent a lot of time with him. Like, he, this man done flew me and all my friends out to Miami. We, did, we were living our best lives up and down New York City, holding hands. Like, we were very public. Like, yeah. Very public. Proudly. So, wait, so is he at the time, like, because... It, he was just a DJ at that time. Say, he it, didn't have Breakfast Club. He was gotcha. just l landing the syndicated iHeart deal. So you knew about that. So y'all y'all would have conversations. I mean... You thought this whole time he was your man. I mean, yeah. He would be at home doing DJ, DJing for the radio, and I would be on Face, like, on the phone watching him and in his house. You hear the kids upstairs. So I didn't think anything of it until that point. So how did it end? It ended, okay, so I called him and, and he was insisting that I didn't say anything. And that night, you know, I was thrown off. We didn't even meet up with him. A couple of days later, I'm getting blown up. Envy's on air, but dogging you out. What did he say about you on air? Um, something to the fact of like how he cheated with someone that was um, beneath him. That whole stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when that happened, I was like, okay, so this is what he's doing. He's trying to say half of everything. I get it, but why run me through the mud when you knew I didn't know? So in order to save his marriage, he had to diminish the relationship he had with you. I wouldn't even do think there's a diminish because at that point it was like, I was too scared to call him and he wasn't calling me after that particular night that I got the phone. He's like, please don't say nothing, don't pick up. She never called me back after that. Couple of days pass, this fool is on radio trying to save half of everything. And at one point, I was just like, okay, I'm never gonna speak to him again regardless. I don't care if he doesn't call me. So I was okay with us not being in communication because I was like, married? like. I got what I got, I could walk away, lesson learned, you know, and that was my first real lesson, like, oh, these men really be out here living double lives. Like, they have kids, but the kid's mother is their wife. 
You know, that was the reality of like, oh, you know, growing up, we don't really see marriages and stuff like that growing up. So it wasn't, you know, I didn't think like, oh, the kids, is he married? He has kids. I'm just thinking, oh, he has a baby mama because that was kind of my situation. Ignorant thinking, but I didn't know any better at that time. Definitely didn't. This is my first industry relationship, technically. Real deal. First industry. Well, Raul too, but I mean like real forefront. Yeah, but this is different. This is yeah, different. It's different. And he was able to shower me with gifts and stuff, which is, I never had that. So it was like a different embracement. I was loving it and I, who wouldn't, you know? But then to get smacked with that reality, I was like, oh, okay, then. So when I didn't hear from him, I actually didn't even care either, you know, until the radio stuff happened. And that's when it was just like, wait. And then that's what set the tone for this narrative that I knew and I went along with it. You know what I'm saying? And it's up, especially on his point, because it's like, you know, you having daughters yourself, you know, to dog me out the way you did just to save face. I mean, you could have at least given me a decent heads up if you're going to go that low. But I mean, you listen to it, you can tell every word was to. Every word he used to, to kind of bring me down was his building box, building block in desperation to try to fix his broken home. And I don't want to talk about it too much because it's safe to say they, they, they're still together. Mm -hmm. God bless them. And they have beautiful kids that are old enough. Yes. That I, but I do feel like I am old to clarify on my behalf this narrative that he was able to paint because he had the outlet he had. He said, they moved on, I know Gia. I, I just feel like it, it's now, important. The thing, this is your time to tell your story and I think what you said is right. I know them too, they're great people. They, they stay together and they told their story and- They even wrote a book about it. Yeah, and this is your story and, yeah. it's, and it's not- And, I, and, I, and, and I, I, I don't fine. wanna, you know, especially knowing that they have old enough kids and, and just out of the respect for the fact that they are, they made it through yeah. whatever they went yeah. through, you know, and obviously it was a dark time, you know, for him and her when I was unknowingly in this yeah. up scenario, you know, but I just want that narrative to please just kind of be cleared on my behalf because yeah. it's like, it's not okay. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, when things happened with my marriage, it's like, oh, good for you, karma, because of what you did to that wife. And it's like, it might be karma, but not from that. And being stuck with the narrative. Yes, yeah. because, you know, it's unfortunate that the way that they did me on the radio is what set the tone. And, and Mona needed that breakfast club plug, so she wasn't going to allow me to tell my story in the sense of what was going on in real time on Love & Hip Hop. I've never been given that opportunity. They needed that breakfast club relationship so they could promote if they ever need to send somebody over there. Mm. Politics is everything. Because you know how many times I said, wait, this man literally is on radio saying X, Y, and Z. Like, I need to talk about this. You know, but it was never allowed. To, I was never allowed to because of relationships. Wow. You know. So a lot of people think Safari tricked you because we did see you two meet they for the think? first time. Well, allegedly. <laughs> Don't allegedly me. <laughs> because on Scared Famous, this VH1 special, he was going hard in the paint for you. And you were sort of like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And then... He was going hard before I even went on that show. Oh. What was it about him that you just weren't instantly attracted to I him? knew. I know. I, I, I just knew he was like this player. He reeked it. Like he re you know, it's funny. The first time I actually was introduced to Safari, he was with a, a f I wouldn't say a, a friend, but someone that I would see around LA and hang out every once in a while. Like, you know, you know, how you go on this party scene, you don't necessarily hang out with certain people when you're in a party environment, they're there too. So you kind of like turn up with these people. So anyway, um, he was with a girl that I knew of, and she introduced me. And right then and there, he's like, you are so, in front of her, in front of her. You are so, damn, I didn't know you was this. And, and right then and there, I was like, oh, this is disrespectful. This man is literally praising me on how beautiful I am right in front of this woman that he's actually with. Red flag. 
So I was just like, ew. So what made you give in to him finally? It was, it took a long time. A long, long time. This man had to go through my friends, family. <laughs> yeah. He definitely pulled out all the stops. Mm -hmm. He actually would speak to my friends, manager, certain family members more than me because at that time it was like if he would text me, I would send him back an emoji or not even reply at all. So he actually went after me, but not going through me. He went through people I knew that we were mutual friends of too. One of my friends went to high school with him. One of my really good friends at the time was, went to high school. So it was like kind of like he, he found his way. But it took a long time. I would say easy three years. Three years he courted you? Mm -hmm. Scare Famous helped. Wow. Helped him a lot. Because <laughs> you saw him differently. That and um, because how hard he went. Because at first, you even see in the show, I thought it was just, he was, that was his tactic to win. Yeah. Because I was definitely a competitor. I was not trying to lose. So I thought that was his tactic to, to soften me up in this, nine and third. But in this, when I died on the show, the producer was like, so far, he's so depressed the last day. Like, I guess he really likes you. So, you know, and, and then it was just not right to send me home. They brought me back from the dead. And boy, was that man happier than I don't know what. And I was like, oh, that was the first oh for me. Like, oh, he actually was like, he like picked me up, spun me around. Like this man was genuinely, everybody ran when I got out of the, the grave. And he was like, Erica. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he really likes me. Yeah. He really likes and me. And then, you know. But you know what's crazy? I did everything in my power for him not to. And I was surprised um, you were with Safari because one thing I know about relationships, when you are this huge personality, um, the face of the show, all these things, typically women like you and men, um, we don't date somebody who also is into the spotlight like that. Mm. You know, we, we tend to date the reserved guy and when I, he also loves the spotlight, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I was always curious if there was competition in your marriage. Mm, that's so funny because uh, I wish I could. I'm only on year three, by the way, of parallel parenting with this person. So, and now Not that I'm co-parenting, you call it parallel. Parallel parenting, meaning it's like. It's like sometimes we fit into the sparking space and sometimes we don't. Okay. <laughs> um, and just, you know, we're not always on the same page, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, but it's only year three and ugh, we're not even close to five. Um, Was there competition? Yeah. I... Mm. I felt like that. That's what I'll say without getting into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the one thing I know too, which, which I do respect by the way, at the end of the day, um, he is the father of your very small children and you wanna be very respectful to that. Safe to say, us being, my whole heartbreak and, and, and the way I was dog walked by him has been viral for like the what, last two and a half years. I know the world is sick of talking about us because I'm sick mm -hmm. of having to. <laughs> so, and now that I'm no longer getting paid, yeah. I do want to be selective in what I say because I feel like enough is already out there. The world has witnessed a lot. And um, regardless to what now, we still have these kids and, and I, I don't know if we'll ever genuinely get to a place where we're like on the same page about our children and how we're gonna raise them and how 
what his priority should be when it comes to them. But I do want to manifest that. My last question with that is, do you feel like he love bombed you? I was... in the hospital before even the, the baby came, trying to prevent the baby from coming. And I was a wife, pregnant, on bed rest. The only person I saw was Dr. Jackie and nurses while I was on bed rest. And, you know, pregnancy and child labor is one of the most dangerous things a woman could experience. My life was on the line. Our child was on the line. And nothing was on the line for him. Just that trip to Jamaica, which we all saw. He had a great time. And did he love bomb me? I'm not an expert. I think the world can definitely answer that as far as what they feel. But I definitely feel now that I know better, he never really genuinely loved me. I was, for the moment, I was convenient for him. And it was beneficial for him. But whatever it was in that moment that he benefited from, which you know, <laughs> because rates went up and offers came through. You know, so there's definitely a big benefit, you know, especially in the way life leveled up and the way he was living from where, when I met him, how he was living to how he was living when he got with me. Um, but yeah, I don't think he genuinely really loved me, now that I know better. And... This, will this be? Yeah, this will be my first time actually saying that. I'm actually okay with it, finally. For a long time, I wasn't. That relationship sucked life out of me. Because I married for forever. I married with the intention to be led, protected. Um, I married thinking he had the mental capacity to, to lead us as a family and build us as, oh, as, as a one, as one vessel. And honestly, I think that's really where I lost him. I lost him when we had to do real life. Mm. When it was like, okay, there's no more roses all over the place. We're not surrounded by fairy tale. Life is happening now. God is testing our, our, our union, our capabilities. Um, when life started to happen, and he has to be responsible for someone other than himself. When he has to think for someone other than himself. When he has to make moves out of respect for someone other than themselves. That's when I lost him. It took me a long time to To be honest, that I put so much responsibility on him when we got married. Just because all my life I've been having to do it all by myself, I finally thought half of my struggle, my every day, could be evened out with my partner. I'm not in this by myself anymore. You know, I don't have to protect myself. I have a man now. I can be submissive. I can
could be solved for the first time in my life. And then I got too soft. And I let too much slide. I got too submissive. I was too, I let too much go for too long. And on top of putting these expectations that I thought would come hand in hand with a husband, it was just too much for him. And then a baby that he didn't want came, put the cherry on top. So, you know, I would give anything in the world to change how we ended. And, um, and have it not be so bad. Um, because it's embarrassing to know that I finally gave this person a chance and I had this magical fairy tale wedding. And here I am present and ready to be the wife that I know I am very capable of being. And it, for it to all mean nothing when life isn't peaches and when life isn't, you know, easy. And we got married, pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. So we made it through a lot together, considering very quickly in, in our marriage. But as things progressed and I expected him to do what a man's supposed to do and when I... Um, And, and, you know, it, it got to a point. He was hurting me so bad, Carlos, that I didn't give a fuck. I, didn't, I was hurting so bad that I wanted to match. And I've said some ugly things to him. Um, and even with that, I wish I could go back and change, you know, just because at the end of the day, yeah, I, was I hurting bad? Was it called for? Probably. But at the same time, this man was my husband, and I should have never used my power to make someone that was, regardless of my husband, feel any less. Because messing with a man's, whatever ego they have, is not an easy thing to come back from. But at the same time, I was pushed to the point of beyond her, you know? A lot of it was public. The flaunting of women, you know, not helping me financially with the kids, but spending all this money on random women that you're dating for the moment, and, and the torment, and the, you know, even brought one on the show, and it was just like, we're not even, I don't understand why I deserved it that bad, because I love the f that man. <laughs> like, I would have done anything for him. Anything. I even sat up there and, and, and got us marriage counseling. You paid for marriage counseling yourself? Yeah, just to try to save us. Like, once I found out the baby was coming and I knew he really didn't, he wasn't fond of that idea. I knew, like, I have to do something drastic to try to help us, and, yeah. But at that point, you know, it's just like, I was pregnant, bed rest, then the baby comes, NICU, he's all over Jamaica. Like, I was just going through it. I was just in so much pain. It built up, built up, built up, built up, built up, that, you know, finally, towards the end, I just was so ruthless with the things I said. But that was my breaking point, I find, because I was really holding my own. Like, even when he first did the whole post about divorce court with him outside the mm -hmm. house and all of that stuff, you know, 
no matter how embarrassed I was or I was really trying still. Because to me, it's like reality TV or not. This is my husband. F***ing Kurt could have three babies on Rashida and make it through. <laughs> and we've also seen worse stuff, you know, and people make it through. You know, and I, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, I'm finally okay with, it not working out. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with it now. It took me a long time though because it was like, damn. But my whole thing was like, how the hell was it so good to end so bad? And why the hell did you go this hard for me just to end up doing me like this? That was the whole thing that I was just, that was making me sick. And then finally I just, one day I just had a moment with God and I just asked him to like help me understand why I'm still caring enough and, and then help me to not care anymore. You, you know, it, it, the realization of like you care so much and the other person cares nothing when you have to face that head on, it hurts. Mm -hmm. It hurt me so much, it sucked the life out of me. I was on that reunion stage in a bag yeah. of bones and a chunky fucking Giuseppe Hill. Um, but yeah. Listen, the elephant in the room is the monkey comment with Spice. You know what's crazy, Carlos? Hey, Raindrops. Tune in next Tuesday, October 31st at 9 a.m. Eastern to catch my exclusive part two interview with Erica Mena.